This meeting has been posted and announced in accordance with Chapter 231, PL 1975. Mr. Palladino, will you please call the roll? Sure. Trustee Barrera, Trustee Jacko, Trustee Munez, Trustee Tunis. Yes. Here. Trustee Velez. Here. Vice President Benamini. Here. President Lamparello. Here. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend meetings of this board, except where specifically exempted by law, at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having same advertised in the Belleville Times. Also, notice of this meeting has been mailed to the members of the Board of Education, the borough clerk, all elementary schools, the middle school, the high school, Hornblower Early Childhood Center, and posted on the district website. Also, this meeting is being televised via the district's YouTube and Facebook pages. Thank you, Mr. Palladino. Can I have a motion for approval of the minutes from January 25th, 2021, both closed and public session? Second. Mr. Palladino? Yes. Trustee Tunis. I didn't, I didn't. Trustee Velez. Yes. Vice President Benamini. Yes. President Lamparello. Take no part. Moving on to our student government representative. Hello, my name is Ryan Nugent and I am the Belleville High School SGO Vice President. Here is a recap of what has been happening in our school. After a few delays due to the weather, the high school finally reopened for in-person instruction on February 8th. We have also just recently come back from winter recess, which was from February 12th to February 15th. The high school has just started holding face-to-face -face classes on Fridays for the rest of the year, and these will operate on a four-week rotation with a different cohort each week. Marking period three has started, and report cards for marking period two have become available on Encores. And lastly, on February 16th, the counseling department and administration hosted virtual information sessions regarding AP classes and the program of studies for sophomores and juniors. Thank you all. Thank you. Moving on to items to be presented by administration, Dr. Tomko. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our February board meeting. Uh, we have a few um, quick announcements and a, a nice uh, presentation. Ms. Demikoff is here for our Black History Month celebration. I tweeted out something today regarding that this is the last week in February, but Again, uh, our black history and multiculturalism in Belleville doesn't stop because the month is over. I think it's really important. Uh, I'm very proud of us celebrating all of our cultures, but I, I think that it shouldn't be just a month or a week or, or whatever it is. So uh, we're excited to show you some of the, just some of the presentations this evening. Um, unfortunately, it has to be virtual again. Hopefully, within the next few months, uh, we can be back to that, which also brings me to our Gifted and Talent program, uh, virtual forensics tournament, interpretive reading. We want to honor those individuals in the, on the agenda. Uh, our programs, oh, I'm sorry, our programs as such, um, Talented and Gifted Forensics, our STEM programs, all these have been thriving tremendously. And that's because of our teachers and our administrators and of course our kids, um, thank you, everything that they um, have been working hard for in such a, uh, a horrific time to be a child, by the way. I think we all can probably agree to that. So I applaud this board uh, and this district for doing everything we possibly can to try to get uh, everything back to normal. Uh, and I hate saying that, but I don't know how else to say it. So uh, I appreciate everyone who was at my forum last week, all the parents that were there, um, some of the community members that decided to show as well. Uh, and I appreciate those questions. I believe it's still online, you can view it. But I think one of the takes out of that was that we are going in the right direction. And as you see some of our neighbors um, in Essex County, some of the troubles that they're having trying to get schools open. Uh, actually, in my county, where I live, there's, you could, nj.com, that article, uh, just incredible uh, things happening, crazy things happening as well. So, so I am proud to sit up here on this dais and be working with a board who in turn governs a, an educational environment where we're doing everything we possibly can to, to combat COVID-19 in everything other but the virus. So in the mental, social, emotional aspects of it. 
um, and we continue to do that. We are working very hard to open up as many seats as possible, inviting our kids back uh, into like we call like a, you know, just an open environment to study uh, even on their off cohort days and be part of the school uh, instead of sitting at home in a room or on a bed logging in. So we're, we're working on that as well. So I appreciate all of your patience. I appreciate the work that our teachers are doing, our administrators are doing and all of our staff. Um, I really think we've come a long way. It's, it's almost a year. It really is. Our next board meeting will be over a year that we've had this issue. So so uh, that went really fast, uh, but at the same time, it was really, really horrific. So uh, we pray that uh, everything uh, pans out well with the vaccinations. You see on the agenda tonight, the board has a resolution. Uh, it, it has written a letter to the governor regarding prioritizing vaccinations for um, educational staff. So we're doing everything we possibly can here as a district. So that's progress. Uh, we can continue to make progress and um, we're very uh, excited to be doing uh, more than most okay so um, that's really it I, I really can't wait until the day when we can really invite some of these groups back um, we want to honor some um, specific members that have gone above and beyond for our district and our students and our families uh, I'm really looking forward to that and I know it'll be in a few months um, that we can I also want to acknowledge once like we do once more, like we do every month, the incredible work of our health and safety teams, uh, Mr. D'Elia and the nurses uh, on a daily basis, um, just making sure that everyone is safe and compliant um, as best we can with COVID-19, because as we all know with the CDC, the changes are rapid, right? So we're staying up on those. We want to keep you guys abreast of all those changes. We want to make sure that we get our students in here as much as we can but we also wanna make sure that we are um, safe and we're doing it um, uh, the way we should with all those precautions that are put in place. Uh, the last thing I will say about that is working with the union, uh, Mr. Mignon specifically and his teams, uh, we are now in the process of putting in, putting in ionizers into all the classrooms. Uh, we are in a two or three phase tiered approach with that, so starting this week, um, at some point this week, early next week, we'll be, um, actually I think tomorrow, right? I think we're starting maybe tomorrow. Um, the pre-K, K one and two rooms and special uh, education rooms will, will, be, will be equipped with what we call ionizers. Ionizers are little devices that attach to the air handlers or the unit ventilators. And what that'll do is that will now give our air quality uh, one extra added level of uh, protection or cleanliness. Um, we couldn't roll this out all in one shot, obviously because of cost and time factor. So we decided to, um, as a cooperative venue, uh, we sat down and we decided to go with the, the younger groups uh, just because we think that um, those groups, you know, tend to maybe, you know, have a little harder time keeping masks on for a longer period, et cetera. Uh, but our goal working with uh, Mr. Paladino and the board and trying to get more monies for these ionizers, um, hopefully by the end of the school year, every room will be outfitted with an ionizer. So that brings us to an extra level of just not only for COVID-19, but flu and other viruses as well. So we really, have, uh, again, uh, appreciate the, uh, the cooperation and all the effort and all the research done by um, the unions uh, and the administrators and everyone else. So. So that's all I have. Um, can you can I just introduce Ms. Demikoff? So we have Ms. Demikoff here today. She's our, one of our directors, but she's the director of curriculum and instruction, and she is also our Amistad compliance coordinator. Um, those of you may not be familiar with that, there's an Amistad um, compliance in New Jersey specifically um, that basically deals with, uh, you know, certain things with black history, et cetera. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that, uh, I know every year we spotlight the curriculum. Uh, we were highlighted when we were a CUSAC review for our curriculum in, in, in Amistad compliance, but you can go ahead, yeah. But uh, I know Ms. Uh, Demikoff put something together for um, Black History Month, so take it away, Ms. Demikoff. And I think that the board would like to uh, go down into somewhere, either on the sides or somewhere, so you can see.
Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm really happy to be here tonight to present how Belleville schools remain in compliance and promote awareness and implement best practices in terms of teaching about acceptance, kindness, equality, and not only during February, which is Black History Month, where we recognize black history in Amistad, but throughout the entire school year. Okay, so first of all, I would like to extend a very, very big thank you to our Belleville teachers beginning with preschool on up through grade 12, for their utmost cooperation, consistent attention to the New Jersey Department of Education mandate, which requires New Jersey schools to teach our students about the slave trade, African-American achievements, accomplishments, and contributions. Please know this presentation is merely just a snapshot. It just merely skims the surface of the highlights and projects that are taking place within our classrooms throughout Belleville that are aligned to black history. So I'd just like to begin with a, a extremely famous gentleman, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And his quote reads, darkness cannot drive out, sorry, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. bill, which became a law in 2002, calls on New Jersey schools to incorporate African American history into their social studies curriculum. This legislation is also created in the Amistad Commission, which is a 23-member body charged with ensuring that African American history, contributions, and experiences are adequately taught in our state's classrooms, and Amistad means friendship. Okay, so our preschoolers, they gain exposure to writings by famous poets, authors, such as Maya Angelou, and exposure to inventors, such as Maggie Lena Walker, Shirley Ann Jackson, and Elijah McCoy, through online books. Our kindergartners are learning about our first African-American president, Barack Obama and they do things such as flip book activities, they also have exposure to different ebooks, and they draw different portraits that portray famous black Americans. Our first graders at school number eight are engaging in discussion about the importance of celebrating black lives. They participate in activities such as reflection writing, matching exercises, and they also have an opportunity all the time to share their reflections with their peers. This is just an example, folks, of the different graphic organizers that are used in the first grade in terms of reflection writing and what I meant by a matching activity. So grade two, school number five, they conduct research on famous African Americans within the areas of politics, science, arts, and athletics. They design their own book covers and they write facts about their famous person that they've selected. School three, grade three, they have learned about African American artist Alma Thomas who has incorporated hearts into her famous artwork, which also exemplifies and represents love and friendship. Okay, school number one, grade four. Our students are learning about how to be good leaders through the story titled Lubaya's Quiet Roar by Newbery Honor winner Marilyn Nelson. The students create posters, they write rousing visual statements on how we can bring positive changes to the world by eliminating prejudice and discrimination. On to our fifth and sixth graders, particularly at school number 10. 
They're researching and composing three paragraph biological reports on African American authors, politicians, and educators, those within the sports world, and they talk about their early life, they write about their education, their accomplishments, lifetime events, goals, and how that person is remembered. This is just an example of a student work sample who did a report on famous African-American Bessie Coleman. Okay, still with grade six at school number nine, our students are creating different rap song lyrics which honor a famous African-American mathematician. This endeavor is a cross-curricular one that ties in ELA, math, and science. The students apply the different things such as order of operations, expressions, and ratios. They create clocks used to solve real-world problems about space or working as a human computer to solve problems. They create Google Slides, and then they get to present their wrap and finished product to their peers. At school number seven, our fifth and sixth graders select a black hero. They complete a biographical sketch and choose their form of media presentation, such as a news article. They can do something like a comic strip, create a video, a slideshow, and they work on this collaboratively and they invent digital ebooks. Okay, and now we're up to Belleville Middle School. Our seventh and eighth graders at the middle school level are creating very, very terrific and exciting websites that feature a biography on their famous inventor and a description of the invention that that famous black American person created. At Belleville High School, we have a course called Intro to Culinary Arts, which is typical that either a 11th grade or 10th grade student would enroll in. And these students prepare presentations on historical African-American chefs, and they get to select their signature recipe, and it's all composed and incorporated into a culinary arts cookbook. Continuing a bit with Belleville High School, in our world history and U.S. history classes, the students recreate civil rights freedom movement posters. They explore black history through the National Archives. They create virtual museums, and they participate in projects about some of our military's most courageous black African-American veterans. So in closing, I thought it would be nice to hear from our students and to hear our students' voice. So I have representation here of one of our talented and gifted students who's a school four, sixth grade student. His name is Enrique Castro. And I know I was very touched by his rendition of a speech which he titled My Dream. So I'd like to play it for you in conclusion. It's disappointing to know that blacks were being treated how, how, how they were treated in the early 1900s. But we can change this. We, the people, can change everyone's perception of being racist. We, the people, can help one another out instead of killing each other. And especially in these times of COVID, 
we the people can be together as one. It's like Martin Luther King Jr. said, hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Every black girl and black boy should be able to hold hands with white, with white girls and white boys. Unfortunately, people still see that as a problem, but that's what we need to do. All Americans need to bond with one another, and maybe, just maybe, racism will die down, and it will die lower and lower until it's completely dead. Racism isn't the answer. Violence isn't the answer. Police brutality isn't the answer. Love is the answer. Absolutely. Tremendous job on his speech and his presentation. So that ends our Black History slash Amistad presentation for you this evening. Thank you so much for listening, and I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Stemikoff. Uh, Madam President, just one more thing. I just, I just um, was sitting out here um, thinking of just the incredible work that everyone is doing here. Um, you know, obviously celebrating all our different cultures and everything. And I, and I just want to, again, just reiterate that even though we are going through this difficult time with COVID-19, we still haven't lost our values here in Belleville. Um, our moral compass, and, and, and we definitely um, do respect one another. Can we, can we all get better at it? Of course we can. We want to work towards it. And, and we know that communication is, uh, you know, communication is the way to do that. Uh, my, well, my first day on the job here um, seven years ago now, was it seven years ago? Almost, yeah. Um, there was a file on my desk as soon as I, as soon as I walked into my office. Uh, there were a bunch of boxes in the back because it was a storage room, but there was a file on my desk about a very um, prominent HIV case that was here. Um, some of you probably remember it. Uh, it was very vocal. It was very um, horrific. And uh, we worked very hard as a community over the last several years um, professionally developing uh, working on communicating and other things. Um, you know, unfortunately, we do still have, you know, bullying even in our community. Um, there's cyberbullying, there's stuff like that. Uh, we're trying to work with everybody in the community, not just our students, adults as well. Um, but again, uh, like the gentleman said, Mr. Castro said at the end, uh, it's little by little, day by day, we can, we can all work at it. So I also want to just acknowledge our tech crew, uh, Mr. Cook, Mr. Parapato, in the back and all of our IT workers, Mr. Sheridan's always here. Uh, I think I, I, uh, I need to apologize because I really don't recognize them enough, especially during COVID-19 over the past year, to actually stay as connected as we did, getting hotspots to all those students in their homes who didn't have internet. Um, we have 2,000 Chromebooks for update on the way. I think they're here this week. Um, you know, just incredible stuff for this community. Uh, we had a one-on-one, one-to-one initiative way before COVID came. Other, other districts had to catch up with us, but just an incredible job. And I think you guys are the also unsung heroes. You're also missed uh, when parents are here at seven o'clock in the morning trying to fix those Chromebooks, right? Uh, banging on the door. So thank you very much. Um, but uh, that's it, progress. Thank you, Dr. Tomko. We're going to move on to um, the Code of Ethics presentation from the Bush Law Group. Every year, board members need to be um, trained on ethics, and Mr. Bush is going to do that for us tonight. Hi, everyone. So we're going to talk not too long. I'm just going to talk about some of the salient matters with respect to the board. But we know that, you know, the board has two areas of laws that it has to follow. They have to follow the School Ethics Act, which is the same provision of law that school administrators, for example, and school officials, or I should say school to follow, which includes school administrators, um, and you know, 
top level and, and principal level administrators. Um, but they also follow what's called the code of ethics for uh, school board members. So let's talk about what a board member may not do. And obviously if there are questions, we can talk about them broadly and we can have this discussion in public uh, as needed. But you know, there's, there's a couple areas that are of particular importance. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you all about the stuff we see most often, all right? Uh, one of them is, refers to private action that may compromise the board. Uh, and also providing inaccurate or confidential information to the public. So what we call the Las Vegas rule in school board law, or at least I call it that, it's just to make it a little more understandable to the average person, and that is what happens in closed session stays in closed session. Now many of you are married, have children, have significant others you live with, and, and you come in possession of a lot of confidential information with respect to personnel matters, or you know, various issues with respect to negotiating contracts or even litigation. For example, if you receive a memorandum from me or an email from me, that stuff is privileged. It's either privileged because it's, it's something that's protected um, as a personnel record, and we take that stuff really seriously. Uh, you rarely get student records, but in a rare circumstance in involving like an HIV hearing before you, you may actually come across student records. Um, those are like, you know, the holy grail of, of confidential information. We are really careful about safeguarding that stuff because, you know, it's part of protecting our, the privacy of our children. Um, but the, the other piece that, that could potentially jeopardize the board's interests are the receipt of emails, documents from the board attorney, either from me or somebody in my office that, that getting out could potentially jeopardize the privilege for the entire board. Um, one issue that we tend to see pretty often is that people hear something in closed session and then go out and repeat it. For example, on social media, or at the supermarket, or in someone's, hopefully not these days in their living room, but in their backyard when you're having a socially distant gathering, right? Those are really what you hear in closed session is very sensitive information and you've got to treat it as not your information to share. So for example, if you come across information in closed uh, and you repeat it, not only is it your jeopardy personally with respect to the ethics rules, but it's the board's jeopardy now because the information that the board is charged with safeguarding, the, the reason we're even allowed to meet about it in closed and not in the view of the public um, is the same reason why you're supposed to safeguard that information. So we really need all board members to take these things seriously. There is, um, you know, another area that I, I like to talk about with respect to social media, and that is when board members speak on social media, they should treat what they're doing as if they're writing a letter to the editor. Now, let me explain. I don't know how many people these days are writing letters to the editor. It's not something that happens as much anymore because print newspapers are something of the past. Uh, at least they're becoming something of the past. So. What people do instead to express their opinions, they go on social media. And we know the rules of social media aren't remotely as formal as those with letters to the editor. So there is an opinion from the School Ethics Commission, an advisory opinion that deals with how board members should conduct themselves when they're expressing their private individual opinions in letters to the editor, which are different than when they're expressing their, which are no different, I should say, than when they're expressing their private opinion on social media. Now, if you're on social media and you're talking about how terrible it was to see the way that the Mets pitcher threw a game. No one's asking you to act like a board member. We know that you're referring to the baseball game. There's no relationship at all to you as a board member. And in that regard, I'm not concerned about it. But if you speak about something that anyone else in the public could interpret as an opinion of the board, it could become a problem for you if you don't have certain writings in there beforehand. Number one, you should make sure it's clear that you're a member of the Board of Education, that this is your own opinion, and that it's not the opinion of the Board of Education. I know that seems strange, and you're going to look like a robot when you write it, but if you insist on going on social media about matters involving the Board of Education, when you're writing in your personal capacity, those three things really should be in there. Why? Because when the School Ethics Commission ruled on this from in the context of letters to the editor, they're really 
ruling out in the context of any print writing or anything that you're saying. And they can't govern the way people talk to each other, but they want people to understand that as board members, you have a higher responsibility than an average member of the public, and you really have got to make sure that you're doing this in your capacity as a individual, and that you're letting people know that you're doing it in your private capacity. You're t literally taking that hat on and off in the most appropriate way possible. I also want to talk to you about uh, the conduct of, uh, you know, the, of, of, of when to vote. And a lot of times the members of the public will wonder why someone's voting on something or not voting on something. Um, you know, there, there are a number of areas, for example, where members of the Board of Education are, um, are required to abstain, right? So if you have a family business, for example, I don't know if any of you do, I'm really, I'm, I'm, and I'll tell you the public, I'm not certainly saying it to the board, but I'm telling the public, there is no specific example I'm thinking of when I talk about a family business. This is Belleville after all, I know I have to make that very clear, but, but the reality is that if you have a family business, and let's say it's a lawn mowing service, and let's say the board uses said lawn mowing business, you know, maybe it's your cousin's business or something. Um, obviously there's a number of issues potentially with that, but the most important thing is that you not be involved. And it's not just the vote, that matters. It's everything related to that conversation. So if there's a contract that's being discussed in closed session because you're negotiating a contract, you can't even, it's not just that you can't speak, you should not be there. We shouldn't even see your face during that conversation because your reactions themselves could be a conflict. Okay, so you should be completely out of that. Now when it's a public meeting, you don't have to get off the dais and then come back on, you just abstain. But, um, you know, the, there, there's, there's something that perhaps doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it just because of the context of conflicts. You know, obviously some, some conflicts are more obvious than others, but the fact that someone, for example, um, is involved in, uh, you know, a relationship. What is a relationship with, with someone? And that question is something that often board members across the state will come to my firm and me and ask, you know, is this a conflict? Is it not a conflict? If, if a certain number of votes isn't required, if there even has to be a question asked, we often just say, just then, just abstain. Just be careful so that you don't have to worry about it. If you're concerned enough to ask the question, then just abstain. But there's also a precise definition because this law has been around for so long that we really know the extent and the boundaries. So for example, um, there are specific exceptions to relationships. So for example, uh, if someone comes to you and says, you know, listen, um, you're a great candidate. I'm gonna support your campaign uh, for, you know, Board of Education. Um, and you know, you take money from that person for your campaign, is that a conflict? No, it's not a conflict because uh, unless the person came to you and said, hey, uh, I've got an idea, I'm gonna ask you to support my lawn mowing service in return for you know, your vote and I'd, I'm gonna give you some money for your campaign, well, that's one thing. But if the idea is just that you know, you're somebody from the community, you accepted money, uh, on, on that person's behalf, there's a specific exception here that says that um, political contributions have nothing to do with a potential conflict of interest. So again, if you, if you, went, you had a spaghetti dinner in honor of your candidacy and you took 50 bucks from every person who attended, that doesn't give you a conflict. So these are just the kinds of things that people talk to me about, they ask me about. This isn't anything specific necessarily to Belleville, but it's also the, the rules of, of, of being a board member. Some of this stuff is, I think, pretty obvious for the average layperson but some of it is a little bit more complicated, especially in this day and age in social media. Is there any questions on anything I said? And if they are, just make them general since we're in public. Obviously, if there's an issue, we can talk about it on the side or in closed session, just to preserve the privilege, if you will. Anything? All right, thank you. That's it? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Palladino, do we have a report from Mr. Egan? Good evening. Mr. Egan is watching on uh, YouTube and says hello to everybody and good evening. Uh, first, he wants to let the public know that he certifies that there's sufficient funds for the remainder of the school year and no line item has encumbrances and or expenditures that exceed any line item appropriation, which means no line item at the end of the month is in the red. 
Uh, governor's budget address is tomorrow, which coincides with the release of ESSER II, or CARES Act II funding. Uh, from what he's heard and we're hearing, amounts should be promising, and hopefully that will enable us to complete the budget and then present to the board and then present to the public. And then last but not least, wants the public to know that, he's a, that we're all awaiting the completion of the June 30th, 2020 annual audit by our auditors, Lurch, Minty, and Higgin. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Palladino. Okay, we're moving on to remarks by citizens on agenda items only. Can I have a motion to open for public participation? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Remarks regarding agenda items that are relevant to the educational system. A participant must sign in and be recognized by the presiding officer. He must preface comments by announcement of his or her name, municipality, and group affiliation if appropriate. The individual called shall proceed with a maximum of three minutes. All statements shall be directed to the president of the Board of Education. No participant may address board members individually. Mr. Sheldon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Michael Sheldon, 47 Floyd Street. Um, before I ask agenda-related questions, just to set one little matter straight, uh, Dr. Tomko mentioned a few moments ago that he's been here seven years, six years, six years. You started mid-February of 2015, so you're just entering now your seventh year. Okay, so just um, one other little mathematical tidbit. Um, couldn't help notice that uh, one member of this board now has missed four out of the last five regularly scheduled meetings. I know the bylaw is that if you miss three consecutive meetings without proper excuse, the board can move to remove that person. But nevertheless, you know, you take on this position voluntarily. You have a commitment to the community and to miss four out of the five last regular meetings, not to be here for voting, et cetera, doesn't speak well. I hope uh, this person graces us the next month uh, with her presence uh, and hopefully she'll make it to the Verona Municipal Court next Wednesday for her next a court appearance. Uh, agenda item 10 for the VW grant for the electric buses. Wonderful news, but um, I was a little bit upset to see that the press release for this came from Jaffe. You know, when Jaffe was hired last October, I uh, expressed a lot of concern about it because the fact of the matter is that Jaffe was a principal campaign contributor to Mr. Mellum in 2018. Um, we were, I, I asked that a limit be set on the amount of money that could be spent for this company, and you agreed to that, $5,000 a year. But you also told us that Jaffe would only be used in emergency situations when there were uh, power outages, storms, snowstorms, et cetera. But uh, I don't quite see the uh, bus announcement qualifying as an emergency announcement. So I'm a little bit upset with this. You know, we, as you've... Uh, You've been somewhat upset by the theme of quid pro quo and political contrivances, but I, I kind of see that this example as being just that. Um, in regard to the buses, I'd like to know where they're gonna be stored. Um, I assume in the new garage facility at State Fair, because you're gonna also need the charging stations. I don't think you could possibly store these at the St. Peter's lot where you're going to enter yet another lease agreement, but hopefully you can elaborate on, on that the other question I had, knowing I only have three minutes here, in the bill list, the Hornblower monthly payment remains $25,000 per month. Last year when this came up, I expressed a lot of uh, concern about the fact that we were paying the property tax bill, and you told us that starting this year, the building would be reclassified to a school that would be tax exempt, and that would reduce the monthly payments from $25,000 down to about $23,000 but yet the same $25,000 a month is here. So what is the status? Why hasn't the Hornblower School been classified as a school and making it tax exempt? I have other questions, but I'll save those to the second, the second session. Thank you. To the chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheldon. Um, just a few off the top of my head answers. Um, the property tax uh, bill or um, 
take the, to ask for the release of the property taxes is, is in the works. It's with the, the Bush Law Group uh, and the municipality. So, I mean, again, we, uh, we could probably ask for another update, but I, I was under the impression it would be the first, the first part of this year at some point. I was hoping by now, but we are, we are aware of that. So, uh, again, that's a municipal issue um, that we're working on. So we haven't forgotten about that. We're not really sure about where the buses are going to be per se yet, but our, we're pretty sure that we're going to put them uh, down by school nine, uh, where we own property down there, um, which is fenced in, um, where we can keep those two buses and we would have to install electric charging stations or whatever it is. So we think that's our best bet because it's, it's plugged in, I'm sorry, it's, um, it's fenced in and uh, it's our property. Uh, you also made reference to the lease um, that's on here this year for the St. Peter's parking lot. That's the back lot, which will now house, hopefully if the board approves tonight, that'll house all of our transportation. Uh, that'll also now remove the trailer from school 10. Uh, and again, it's a, it's, we think it's a perfect lot. It has its own um, exit and entrance off the other side. Uh, that one side street as well, the name's escaping me, but um, so that we think it's going to be by school nine for those two buses. Uh, and, then, and then just to talk about uh, Jaffe, so we were, um, well first I'll talk about, because you mentioned quid pro quo, which is obviously a big theme here um, in Belleville. Um, the, the whole idea of using Jaffe was to basically uh, stay with the sta same communication group that the municipality was using. We try to do that many different um, venues that we can. Anything that uh, the municipality is using or we're using, we feel vice versa, it should be the same group. It doesn't really make much, much sense to try to split communications when some of those things would be um, the same. So for example, I'll give you a prime example. Jaffe um, wrote something with regard to COVID that was a press release ready to go um, that was never released, but it was put together uh, that I had to basically verify for the mayor. Uh, so we kind of worked together on that. That was prior to us in a contract with them. So it just made sense to use the same group. Um, there's a million uh, media groups out there. But I do want to mention um, what you said with regard to um, the contract and with regard to what we're gonna use them for, and I think you were correct in part in some of the things we talked about, but, but we talked about big items. So just to remind you, when you were even on the board, um, we did use Jaffe for the holiday event. We also used Jaffe for Hornblower, um, the Hornblower rib ribbon cutting. So I think the electric buses and saving this township 830,000 plus dollars is definitely something that I wanted to get into some media junkets outside of our normal Twitter and whatnot. So this is nothing different than we've done two other times prior um, that the board was very aware of um, in, those, in those media um, outlets. So, so uh, again, we're going to use Jaffe up to the amount that was allotted by the board, uh, which was $5,000. Uh, I think they do an outstanding job. Um, I mean, I've, I've dealt with many media groups uh, in my 20 some odd year career. Um, they're very thorough. They also give me updates uh, weekly on, on other um, happenings around different districts. So they keep me abreast of some of those media uh, things that are happening, and that's free of charge. But, um, you know, again, it was just trying to, to, trying to use the same um, company that the municipality was using. I, I, I'm, I'm unaware of what's happening with the municipality uh, with, with their, um, their utilization of Jaffe. It's a totally separate contract. Uh, and we have a do not exceed order, uh, and that's where we're at. And we're only going to use Jaffe and that media outlet for big events, uh, yes, emergency events, uh, if there's something big that has to happen. But just like we do with the holiday, the holiday um, drive through where they put that together, they actually even uh, were the ones that got News 12 here that evening. Um, and then also uh, Hornblower Ribbon Cutting. Was, they were here all, mor all morning taking pictures and, and putting in the paper, so. Thank you. Ms. Polite. Good evening. Um, in reference to the lease 
leases and where the buses are actually being housed. There's the property near school number nine. We're talking about now State Fair. And in addition to that, St. Peter's. So we have three different locations for our buses. Whereas previously they had all been centrally located in one location. Is this an effort to save money? And if so, how much are we saving by having them in three different locations? Um, usually when things are centrally located, there's more of a benefit uh, security wise as well as maintenance and um, use, normal everyday use for maintenance. That's my first uh, question. Um, and uh, I have a question regarding COVID, the COVID numbers, not specifically how many cases, but what has been spent in regards to cleaning? What's the protocol? Um, how were the COVID um, standards maintained? How many hours per week? How many people? Overtime, if it was, overtime was involved. Um, and I know you won't necessarily have the numbers tonight, but I know that there should be a report um, because the state and county sometimes request items like that regarding COVID and whether or not it's a funded mandate or unfunded mandate. So if you, you could uh, provide those numbers to the public will also be uh, great. And uh, my third comment is in regards to uh, Mr. Egan. Um, he's been physically present, for, missing for quite a long time. And we do hope that he is well and all is uh, understandably uh, well with him under the circumstances with COVID and things of that nature. Is it possible that he could give us a signs report and kind of post it to the website for uh, transparency and also to instill confidence in that uh, it's just not, as they say in court, hearsay. He said, she said, uh, it would be, um, I would think, um, a positive, a positive effort on uh, everyone's part. And that's it. Thank you. To the chair. Thank you, Ms. Poit. Um, the Mr. Egan uh, information, I'm sure he's listening, but we'll, uh, we'll relay that message. Um, and the COVID numbers, I, I think I have everything down, so whatever we can give you that's not, you know, has to be open, we'll, we'll let you know, but um, we'll try to get that to you. As for the buses, um, there, as far as planned right now, there are no buses at State Fair, there won't be, I know uh, Mr. Sheldon just mentioned that, but that, that wasn't the plan. State Fair, that procurement of that area there was because, if you recall, several years back we lost our maintenance garage and we haven't had any place to um, uh, basically fix all of our vehicles. Uh, the board has incurred a major expense over the years because of that outsourcing, et cetera. We've had mechanics that are on the floor. Uh, actually, Mr. Grom and, and I and Mr. Paladino sat down um, to try to build a building on our space. and. Uh, I applaud Mr. Grauman's efforts for that. Unfortunately, we didn't have the money at the time, but we did spend well, like $50,000 on plans, so the board had to spend that too. So this space now that we're, we are leasing um, from State Fair brings back the maintenance garage so we can actually um, maintain all the vehicles in the fleet. So, so no, no buses will be stored there permanently. Um, they were all at 10, which took up a lot of space, a lot of neighbor complaints. A lot of uh, that dead end street, there were a lot of issues. Um, so this will rectify that. And uh, that's that part of that back part of that St. Peter's parking lot. Um, it's gonna work out perfectly. Uh, again, another partnership in town with uh, a local community organization. And uh, you know, just that had some space and exactly what we needed. So now we can house all of our buses at one spot. We could put um, some security uh, cameras there. It's, it's, uh, it's well maintained. Um, and that's really going to be 
that should be enough to, to hold our entire fleet, which will be perfect. Um, except the electric buses, of course, we, we need a little special um, treatment for them right now um, with the, uh, the electric charging stations. So that's why that school nine area uh, that we were going to build the maintenance part garage on um, will now be storage for those uh, individual buses. So thank you. Mr. Mignon. Okay, Mike Mignon, president of the Belleville Education Association, um, president of uh, over 400 uh, members that work in district. Um, I want to start off by, by saying on behalf of, of our teachers, our counselors, uh, CST and nurses, um, how, uh, how hurt, I guess the best word you can use is hurt, disappointed, discouraged um, by many of the comments that were made at the superintendent um, forum by some of our parents. And I'm hoping that that was just a small minority of how our parents really feel about their teachers. Um, we try to pride ourselves um, as, as the educators in town not to, um, you know, showboat what we do here. I'm going to stop um, your time for one second if I can, sir. Is this related to an agenda item? Yeah. Okay. Sure. It's a, Dr. Tomko spoke about MERV 13s and things of that sort, so I'm, I'm getting there. Are we approving this? That's not an agenda <laughs> item. Can you come back up here in the next forum? We just have to keep this organized. This is for agenda items only. This is for, sorry? This is for agenda items. Yeah, so anything, anything that's on the agenda, which is really tough to say what's not on the agenda. This is just for things that are, this section is only for agenda items. The second time you can talk about anything you want. That's what he's telling you. Right, but what I'm talking about is not on agenda items right now. None of this stuff. The policies that you guys are about to implement are on the agenda. They have to do with what I'm going to talk about. Which, which policy are you referring well, to? You're this? talking about the policies of leaves of absence. I'm about to get to that also. You're talking about other policies that are on here. So I don't, I don't understand how what I'm about to talk about doesn't, doesn't pertain. Okay, keep going. Go ahead. So, so anyway, I, I started off by saying this because, again, like I said, I want to get to some of the things that we have been doing here in, in this district and, and, and our superintendent maybe it wasn't as clear in that forum as, as, as he could have been um, when, he, when, when he spoke about, you know, the, the, the air filtration in this district. Well, what the Teachers Association leadership was the one who actually fought strong for that, for the MERV 13s. We were coming back to this district with MERV 8s in our, in, in our uh, um, unit events. We paid for our own uh, engineer to come in through union dues, through, through teachers' dues. We paid for an engineer to come in here and, and show the district that we could, in fact, fit MERV 13s in our filters. And then they, they, the, the district uh, uh, purchased them, which we thank you for. Then we started talking about ionizers also. Again, Doc spoke about that today. Um, and that's great. But we do this stuff not for us. We do this stuff for the children. And I know that the science says that the children don't catch the, the, the virus like, we, like the adults do. But how about the children's parents? How about the parents that are out there, right? The parents that are out there, the kids bring it home to the parents. If we can avoid any spread in the district, we can avoid it going home to the parents also, okay? So we don't want to take any recognition for the things that we do, but sometimes it pains me that I have to stand up here and talk about those things. Um, I also was a little concerned about um, some of the things that were said at that forum that, again, pertain to uh, items here. Um, we're talking about uh, opening, um, I could save that one for, for next time, um, for the next session. So this way I don't, I don't use it all in one. Talking about COVID-19, okay. Um, so we have uh, a staff members, it was said the staff members um, that see friends Okay, I'm sure this is a policy. That's why I'm up here talking under the policy uh, part. But if you go and you v visit a friend and you say, and, and you don't know that friend you know, has anything, and that friend gets back to you and says, okay, I have COVID, you have to quarantine. So I, I don't understand. Is this a district policy now that now that teacher has to uh, 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 either take a leave of absence or pay for a sub 
listen to what you're trying to condone here. Okay, there's two facets to this that I think that we don't, we don't see as we sit in the big seats and we're not actually in the classrooms, right? And one of them is that you are actually encouraging people to not say that they went out uh, to a different state and, uh, and that they need to come back and quarantine because they're going to lose money. They're not, they're, it's going to jeopardize their well-being of, of their family, right? So they're going to say, okay, well, then if I have to come back and I have to take 10 days worth of a quarantine on my own back, taking a leave of absence, when I can work virtually, because this is it. This is, this is for here, here for good. Virtual learning is here for good in some aspect. We all know that. Remote learning is now part of our educational uh, experiences for our kids. So now you're saying that, these, that, that, that they're going to have to come and they're gonna, you expect them to say, oh, yes, I went away to Florida to visit my family, like every other citizen in this, in this state and country can do, right? But now we have to come back and have to quarantine, take either 10 personal days or go on a leave of absence or pay for $100 for a sub to take my class. What you're doing is you're, you're inviting vi the virus or the potential virus into our district, that's number one. And number two, what's the best pa practice on that? Mr. We're Mignon, educators. Mr. Mignon, my alarm's not working, but you're about 50 seconds over, including the extra time I gave you before. Okay. Can you just come back in at the next session? And, Can and I just finish? finish my statement, being that you kind of like wasted a little bit of it? By no, I, I gave you, actually, you have actually oh, had, you about, you had about a minute extra. Yeah, no, we've been pretty. Right, can I just finish my statement on this one then? The That's it. Go ahead. Just, I mean, I'm not going to read any more. I just want to finish the second point to this, and then I'll come back and do the rest of what I want to say. Hopefully, I, I get the, my time for that. Um, but secondly, we're talking about educational value, okay? Would we rather, as a district, have someone take a leave of absence, which means now they need a substitute? So a substitute's going to teach your children, the parents out here, right? Going to teach your children for two weeks when the teacher can do it remotely. It, it makes no sense. It's not a best practice for educational, for, for education if we're going to put, give our kids off to a substitute for two weeks because we, they're now going under quarantine when they can actually teach remotely. So I want you to think about those two things, and I'll come back and I'll give you some more things that you can think about. Thank you. I have a motion to close public participation. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, moving on to resolutions. Can I have a motion on personnel numbers 1 through 12? Motion. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Palladino? Trustee Tunis? Yes. Trustee Velez? Yes. Vice President Benamini? Yes. President Lamparello? Yes. We have nothing on curriculum instruction. Moving on to board action, board policy. Can I have a motion on follow me now? No, section nine, number one through seven and nine through 12. Make that motion. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Palladino? Trustee Tunis? Yes. Trustee Velez? Yes. Vice President Benamini? Yes. President Lamparello? Yes. Can I have a motion on nine eight? Motion. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Palladino? Trustee Tunis? Yes. Trustee Velez? Absolutely yes. Vice President Benamini? Yes. President Lamparello? Yes. Okay, we had an addendum that we're adding on to the agenda. Can I have a motion on 913? Motion. Second. Dr. Tomko, will you read the resolution? I shall, Madam President. <clears throat> Addendum, resolution in accordance with policy 0145, in accordance with the requirements of NJSA 18A colon 12-3 and Board of Education policy number 0145, the board shall consider the removal of board member Erica Jocko, who has missed two consecutive board meetings, including four out of the last six meetings, if she also fails to attend the next board meeting, which would total three consecutive missed board meetings without good cause. 
The board shall provide board member Jocko with notice of at least 48 hours in advance of the next board meeting at which the shall conduct a vote on her proposed removal to the extent that the aforementioned conditions have been met. Thank you, Dr. Tomko. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Palladino? Trustee Tunis. Yes. Trustee Velez. Yes. Vice President Bennett Meany. Yes. President Lamparello. Yes. Moving on to purchasing and business services one through five. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Palladino? Trustee Tunis. Yes. Trustee Velez. Yes. Vice President Benamini. Yes. President Lamparello. Yes. Moving on to finance, one through six. Can I have a motion? Motion. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Palladino? Trustee Tunis. Yes. Trustee Velez. Yes. Vice President Benamini. Yes. President Lamparello. Yes, with the exception of check 081141. How do you vote on that one? No or abstain? Yes, on everything but that check. Can you vote no on that check? Yeah. <coughs> Moving on to remarks by citizens. Can I have a motion to open for public participation? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes, aye. Remarks regarding any items and issues that are relevant to the educational system. A participant must sign in and be recognized by the presiding officer and must preface comments by announcement of his or her name, municipality, and group affiliation if appropriate. The individual call shall proceed with a maximum of five minutes. All statements shall be directed to the president of the Board of Education. No participant may address board members individually. Mr. Sheldon. Good evening once again, Michael Sheldon, still at 47 Floyd Street. Um, thank you for that little surprise addendum. I often have clashes with uh, members of this group, but in this one instance, I think we're on the same page, so thank you. Um, I was doing some basic arithmetic tabulating the extent of all of the lease agreements that have now been entered into, and uh, according to my Arithmetic, no need for elliptic integrals of either the first or second kind, just basic addition here. Um, it looks like uh, at this point we're at least $1.1 million in lease obligations um, at, at this point, as, as this year fully kicks in, because you have some, some lease agreements that are in the initial phases, but by the time we get to September, you're going, we're going to be looking at uh, $1.1 million plus a year for lease. I noticed in reviewing the bills list for last month and this month, um, last month the, the new preschool facility at State Fair with the BOE offices and maintenance garage, there was a $60,000 payment last month, but nothing appears this month on the fe February bills list. So I found that somewhat odd why so much last month, nothing, nothing this month unless it was a, an oversight. But I also noticed that um, last month the Dalia building received $10,000. Now this thing was just uh, considered by the board in December. Uh, Ms. Bennett and I voted no, but uh, last month the Delia building got $10,000. So what if you backdated this to last September? Because this month they have their expected $2,500 per month, but there's a $10,000 payment to them last month, which requires some explanation. Uh, in regard to the uh, perfunctory um, address given by uh, uh, Jonathan Bush regarding ethics, very well said and done. Uh, I know you're required to do this by, by law each year, but um, one thing struck me as odd. Uh, it is well known that um, several members of this board, uh, their campaigns were run by, financed by the current mayor of Belleville. Um, one trustee got a significant, at least one significant campaign contribution last October, uh, and yet uh, uh, went ahead and voted for the lease agreement for Mr. Mellum's building on Union Avenue last month. Now, I understand your explanation that, you know, you, just because you get a, a contribution doesn't mean it, it impugns your independence on voting for something later on, but I can't help but recall that back in 2018, I had been on the board for the better part of the year when the teacher's contract 
came up for a board, board vote. And even though I supported that contract, uh, I knew it would be uh, uh, improper for me to vote on it because both B-Vote and the BEA had supported me the year before. They never said anything to me, uh, uh, Mike, if we help you here, you're gonna have to make sure you vote for our contract next year. So I, I, and, and I was reminded by you, Jonathan, and Ms. Lamparello also reminded me multiple times that I could not vote uh, and uh, vote on that matter. And it was not any reason for contention. I knew I, I shouldn't vote just because of the air of impropriety if I had. So I don't understand why I was, I, I was compelled not to vote then, but other board members who clearly had conflicts of interest because of their campaigns being run and financed by the mayor, who in turn got significant ca campaign contributions from Mr. Dorso right after the, that group got elected. That doesn't seem to be any, any ethics problem. So maybe you can explain that later on. Now lastly, I'm, I'm running short of time here. It's only five minutes. I wish I had attended the superintendent's forum so I would have had unlimited time to speak. There was a lot of stuff said there that really needs to be refuted. But uh, two things in, in particular. You said that you searched everywhere in the town for uh, space and that if anyone could find a, a suitable space for less than $2 a square foot, please let you know. Mellum's building is only 2,100 square feet and according to the email you sent to me on January 25th, we were only using the basement and the first floor. So that's only uh, something like 1,000 square feet of space and you're paying 3,000 dollars a month to start so that looks like three square three dollars per square foot not under two dollars per square foot which was what you tried to tell the community was a deal breaker there's a lot more i would love to say in response to all of the things you said during the forum in, 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 trying to imply that i was well aware of all of this when i was chair of the operations committee in 2019 the only thing we were dealing with in 2019 was the referendum but lastly 10 seconds more lastly you you um said during your uh, forum that when you came to Belleville, you, uh, you, in the initial years, you were accused of, uh, of, of political favoritism, nepotism, etc. And you said that, that nothing could be farther from the truth. But do I need to remind everyone about two cases in particular, Giovanni Cosmano and Doug Di Matteo? Giovanni Cosmano was your campaign manager and treasurer when you ran for state assembly in 2013. You brought him here from from Patterson for Sake, his salary overnight went from 65,000 to 120,000. And then Mr. DiMatteo was and remains a trustee for the Elmwood Board of Education, where you came. Mr. Sheldon. To, right. But, you know, he was your boss and you brought him here as building and ground supervisor. Mr. Sheldon. Yes. Your time's up. I understand. Thank you. All right. If you let could me, explain that, that let, ethics let me, to me uh, situation at some point, I'd appreciate it. Let me, let me also just provide for, for you and for the community in, in response to your question. It's a good one. It's, a, it's one of the anomalies of this whole School Ethics Act where there's some confusion because there seems to be inconsistency, but they have to draw lines in particular places to make it more understandable for all of us, but it makes it clear as mud, obviously, unless you do this for a living like I do, so I can give you the distinction between what you're describing as it relates to your, I guess, prior endorsement from the association and why you weren't able to vote on the contract previously versus what you allege, and I don't know anything about what you're describing about the political contributions piece, but the political contributions and why that wouldn't conflict with someone. The, the School Ethics Commission, for whatever reason, has made specific case law determinations as to the point when someone is conflicted and then when they magically become non-conflicted. They have said basically that one year from the endorsement, the first, it, it, it's, it's also hard to figure out when that year starts. Does that year start from the endorsement date? Does that year start from the election date? Does that year start from the date of service? But to be safe, we generally advise our clients to not participate in matters related to the association if they've been endorsed by that association for one year into their term. Again, if someone's conflicted during that year, I don't know how the 366th day on a non-leap year suddenly magically makes them non-conflicted, but that's just what the law says with respect to union affiliation or union endorsement. As it relates to political contributions, there is a specific provision in 18A 12-24, which is the School Ethics Act, which I'm, you know, you're well familiar with now having served on the board, where it says no school official 
uh, shall solicit or accept any gift, favor, loan, political contribution, service, promise of future employment, or other thing of value based upon an understanding that the gift, favor, loan, contribution, service, promise, or other thing of value was given or offered for the purpose of influencing him directly or indirectly in the discharge of his official duties. That makes sense, I think, to most of us, that if someone gives you something and says, in return, you do something for me, that's a problem, right? It's not only, I guess, the ethics here, that could potentially be something more serious if you were to do that. The following sentence in the statute relates, I think, to what you're talking about. It specifically says, this provision shall not apply to the solicitation or acceptance of contributions to the campaign of an announced candidate for elected public office if the school official has no knowledge or reason to believe that the campaign contribution, if accepted, was given with the intent to influence the school official in the discharge of his official duties. You know, they didn't want this to become an issue. They realized that communities in New Jersey, most of them are smaller than Belleville, and they didn't want a situation where people are raising money, as they should do when they're running for office, right, from as many people as possible, as opposed to one or two big donors, to stop them from being able to vote on anything. So while those may seem, and I, by, by the way, I don't disagree with you personally on the fact that there seems to be some sort of like, there's a lot of vagueness and wiggle room. There's, there's, the there's, there, there, there seems to be an inconsistency between what you've described, which is a separate example with respect to union endorsement, and this, they've drawn bright lines in both cases, so at least we understand what the law is. There is no problem with receiving a campaign contribution from someone, so long as it wasn't accepted specifically for the purpose of influencing them. In other words, Michael, if you make a contribution to my campaign, my campaign and you say, Jonathan, I really want you to hook me up when you become a, a member of the Board of Education, that's a problem if I go ahead and do that, right? But if you make a contribution to my campaign and later on I end up doing something that happens to benefit you, there is zero problem based on the way that that statute is written. So that's I'm just trying to draw the dis distinction so you understand. Right. Well, with my two cents, they should just make a consistent rule that any direct or in-kind contributions one year after your election, you automatically exclude yourself from any, any votes that may have any impact on people who donated to your campaign the year before. But it's just my ranting and ravings. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, Mr. Sheldon Cooper, you're just, just the, some of those things that will definitely get you the uh, information for um, the 10,000, I'm, I'm sure the $10,000 payment I'm going to guess, but I want to have Mr. Um, Paladino get you information th throughout the week. But I think it has to do with a um, security deposit as well uh, that was in there for the, the uh, chiropractic building uh, that we rented out. Uh, I'm sure the lease agreements are totaling 1.1 million somewhere. I mean, you're talking about many, many uh, sites. Um, we're going to be adding, uh, we're going to have um, over 200 students at Hornblower next year. It's an incredible preschool environment. So, I mean, that's going to take up most of those leases. So. Uh, and again, uh, by moving into those two office buildings, um, we're now going to add at least two more rooms to our regular, or two more preschool rooms to our actual uh, classrooms. So that's, that's an incredible feat too for this community. Um, I won't m say anything about the School Ethics Commission because you know, I, I do sit on that, but uh, I think Mr. Bush did a great job answering those questions. Uh, the space uh, on Union Avenue, uh, that's the Alpha Dog building, that we are uh, occupying July 1 uh, is the downstairs, upstairs, and back area, and there's a storage area. So it's a little bit more than you ex uh, described. I don't know if, the, if that's changed since the information you had, but that's uh, whatever that space is, is I mean, we've, we've had it checked several times for square footage. And if, and if for some reason we have to attenuate that moving forward and we use less, I'll, I'll try to amend the agreement, but uh, that's where that is. Uh, and, and I would totally be remiss if I didn't bring up Mr. DiMatteo and Dr. Kuzmano, who are two incredible gentlemen uh, that did work very hard for this district. Um, uh, Mr. DiMatteo, who, yes, is a board member in Elma Park, where I used to be, was here two years prior to me getting here. So again, this is why some of this information is very dangerous. When you come up and speak, please have the information correct. That He was here at least a year and a half, two years before, I think, you even posted the job here. Uh, Dr. Kuzmano was a treasurer in Warren County, and yes, I did run for office, I don't know how many years ago now, but he was, Warren County and Sussex County are together in that district, so yeah, he was part of that. Uh, that's actually how we met. Um, we, I think we, you know, unfortunately, uh, I got slaughtered in that election, so uh, we didn't really spend too much time together, but uh, he came here and applied for a position, came through the vetting process, which was prescribed by the, the board at the time, 
uh, and he started here working on title grants, which is his forte, and he did a phenomenal job. So, I mean, I mean, that's really all I have to say about those two, but again, uh, let's be very clear that Mr. DiMatteo was here well before I got here, so that's it. Thank you. Ms. Polite. Hello again. Okay, in regards to St. Peter's lease, uh, can you discuss like how much that lease is for or no? Okay, so then, um, <clears throat> as a school leasing property from a non a nonprofit organization, um, they're going to be exposed to UBTI, and uh, so that's, you know, if, if it's a, a monetary uh, transaction that actually is occurring. In, in that regard. So they would be exposed to 37% taxable income on any monies that they would receive from the school as UBTI. So I don't, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's for the lawyers and the accountants to all figure out. Um, and the security in an open lot would not be as advantageous as a lot that is in fact closed. Um, in regards to COVID and um, safety, health and safety um, precautions, um, what are, what, and I know you don't have these numbers now, what is the pupil, number of pupils per school pre-COVID and uh, post-COVID and the teacher-student ratio by class? Um, and lastly, uh, COVID-19 definitely has impacted us all in unbelievable, horrific ways. And um, the pandemic, needless to say, is something that has devastated all of us. Demands on the maintenance staff, uh, the teachers, counselors, everyone. Have there been any changes specifically in the monies that are allocated to the maintenance department for COVID? And that's by the department. But also, my key question is in the overall pay, uh, payroll, specifically to individuals' payrolls, and have there any been any line item transfers in regards to the maintenance department and any stipends that are given or allocated to specific individual individuals and not the department overall. Thank you. And if so, what, what are those amounts? Thank you to the chair. So there's a few questions there. Let me just get my thoughts together here. Um, the UTI, the VTI that you were talking about is, would be on the uh, parish, so that really would have nothing to do with us. Um, they're a pilot, I would guess, so, I mean, you do bring up a good point. They would have to kind of, um, I guess, claim that as income. Uh, the, the, the agreement that we made for the amount of square footage there um, with regard to the space and uh, some additional things uh, with regard to fencing to make sure it was secure, and I think we're going to do our own, our own snow plowing. It's $2,000 a month. Uh, and I think it's going to probably host 40, uh, 37 or 40 people. 20? Oh, 20. Why am I thinking 37? Sorry. About 20 vehicles, but bit, uh, not the maintenance, right? The buses. Um, so it's about $2,000 a month. Um, if you would recall, possibly we talked about it. We were trying to rent or I'm sorry, lease property across the river in North Arlington, the old Comcast building. Um, so it was a little bit more at Comcast, but we were getting a little bit more there. So we, 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 we kind of ranged it in um, for how much transportation storage is going at. So, so that was the agreement back and forth that we, uh, we negotiated. 
Uh, we'll try to get you those. I'll try to get you those COVID health and safety numbers, like we said. Um, and yes, the demands of COVID have been incredible. Um, have there been line item transfers? I'm sure we probably have had line item transfers. I mean, um, for just not maintenance, but everything um, due to money coming in and out during such an unprecedented time. Uh, I don't. I don't. I. I don't want to read between the lines, but I'm guessing the maintenance monies that we're talking about. Um, last meeting, I think there was an addendum to contracts for our supervisor and our assistant supervisor of buildings and grounds uh, with regard to their contracts, with regard to uh, overtime that they're permitted to get with uh, due to snow plowing, et cetera. So there were some changes there. Um, also, if you've been following some of the board meetings, uh, what the board has decided to do through our recommendation, Mr. Paladino and myself, was to outsource um, some of the jobs that were in referendum to our maintenance, um, some of our maintenance maintenance uh, individuals for overtime. That also was included um, with those, uh, the, um, the administrative hierarchy as well. That was all in their contract. So for example, um, the lighting that is done in all the schools, uh, we took that out of the referendum project and that's being done internally now. Um, also, you know, these ionizers now that are going in, uh, there's going to have to be some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, overtime for that. So, so uh, yes, if you're asking if there's been more overtime allocated to our maintenance crew and uh, individuals that are in the administrative hierarchy, the answer is yes. Mr. Rodriguez. This work a man in the building. <clears throat> uh, Ruben Rodriguez, Cedar Hill Avenue, um, Belleville. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I, real quick, just to, before I get started, um, I want to appreciate you letting Ms. Bavia know about my comment. She was very taken aback. And uh, I also want to, I, I do want to give a shout out to the, the food's been coming home every day. And as someone who's worked in restaurants, I can tell you what it is to, to try to, try to, you know, switch to boxing lunches, you don't know how many you need, and to try to keep all that fresh and uh, looking different, and the kids actually eat it. So it's actually, the Chartwell should be commended for um, how hard they're working and how whoever's running the whole thing, it is, it's, it's gotta be a, a daunting task, so. Um, but really, I, I really also, I wanna thank you, Dr. Tomko. I know when I came back here in September, I, you know, I. You know, I've never been short to mince words. I've had a lot of opinions, and I disagree with you sometimes. But I, uh, you know, your foresight and your leadership has led us to my kids in school five days a week, and it's really appreciated. And last month, I talked about the uh, haves versus have-nots with the champions being open and people not being able to go back to work because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to pay the money. And I think your idea of the tutoring or whatever, I think it needs a better name. But uh, whatever you want to call it, I think it's a great idea. I had mentioned it to my neighbor today, and she was ecstatic because now her husband, if, you know, if it happens, will be able to go back to work. But really, the big thing I want to commend you is at the meeting the other night, Wednesday night, um, you didn't pull any punches. You were very honest with us. You stood and you answered every question. There was no five-minute time limit. Um, a lot of pa parents might have had questions or concerns or maybe some things that, that you know, that. Like I think I said, you know, we're not adversaries. The parents and the teachers are, we're not adversaries, we're allies. Um, so, but some people might have had an experience that changes their beliefs that led them to say something. But, um, you know, you took that and when it got out of hand, you brought them into the, you know, you said meet me afterwards. So I thought that was very good. And just the fact that, you know, it was the first meeting where we talked about education. You know, we come here every month and it's money and it's leases and it's this and it's that and it's, oh, God, with the money. I get it. but. You know, at the same time, you're here to educate our children, right? That's job one. Um, and just the admittance when you said you understand there is going to be some small uh, learning gap. Let's face it, if, uh, any problem you're ever going to have, the first step in a problem is identifying the problem. So the fact that you can even say that, it just shows me that you're, you know, you're willing to go above and beyond. And it's really important to you because I know there's a lot of members of the community that want to get back into school and uh, they want to feel safe. And like I said, I, I was looking over your numbers with the new on the website, you have the little click now. So I, you know, anybody that doesn't know about that um, should hit that. 
And the one question I did have, though, was that 9-8 resolution. Is that the letter to, that you had spoken about to write? Um, that's the letter, right? That you were going to, about getting the teachers vaccinated and more priority? Well, I, I mean, I think that should go out to everybody. I mean, I think I would love to see, I mean, I don't know, maybe we could do it ourselves, but I would love to see, you know, the teachers and the parents get behind that and maybe start, we have 4,500 kids, give or take, start a little writing campaign. That's 9,000 parents that can email, write, and uh, send letters to our assemblymen, assemblywomen, and, um, you know, it's back down to Trenton and hell, all the way to Washington if we have to, because teachers in this country are working very, very hard, and for some reason they get the brunt of it, and people think that you complain about COVID education, it's complaining about the teachers, it's not. And that's what I just want to say thank you for the other night. And, you know, if anybody has, you know, problems with what you said, then they probably should have came the other night. Because unfortunately, there was only 47 people here that I counted at the, at max, where we had 150 available. So um, that's it. And please, you know, let's get going with this uh, tutoring or whatever you want to call it. And uh, let's get that letter writing campaign now, because we got to get these teachers vaccinated so we can get back to work. Okay. Mr. Chair, Mr. Robert, thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words. I don't get those a lot. I appreciate that. I will say I, I am a, a straight shooter, though, and I, that tutoring program is just to go over a little bit. Um, we're going to open up spots in the schools for those individual students that aren't, um, you know, in that cohort. So if you're a B-Day cohort and you can't get in on A-Day, you can come and, and do that. But I will say that was Mr. Mignon's idea. He gave me the idea in my office, so I'm not going to take credit for that, Mike. But I appreciate us working together on that. So. So that came right from the teachers union, our administrators jumped on it, and we're hoping we're gonna roll that out in a week or so. So that's us working together. But thank you for, thank you for everything, appreciate it. Mr. Mignon. Ready? He's daddy. Come on, Mr. Bush, it's not fair. All right, so, um, okay, so I just wanna start off again by uh, just reiterating, I'm going to recap real quick, but I'm going to reiterate that, um, and Dr. Tomko is a witness to this, of all the arguments we had since September on reopening the schools, never once, and he can say this, he can vow for this, never once did we as association leadership say, we don't want our teachers to go back. Never once. Okay, that was not even an option. It was how are we going to get them back safely? That was always the question. So I need to put that out to the parents because I, you know, when, and, and, and my apologies for being so aggressive tonight, but I just listened to the forum because just before I got here. So obviously it's like, a, it's like it just happened. But um, we were always planning on coming back. We always wanted our, our kids and teachers to come back. It's just we want to do it in a safe manner. All right, just to recap. Okay, so from the forum. If a member is out with a friend who, is la who later is found to have contracted COVID-19 and the staff member has quarantined, quote, that is on them, and that came from our superintendent, to take an unpaid leave uh, or, or use a personal day. Okay, so this policy puts other staff members, students, and, communi and the community at risk. These staff members are not asking to quarantine themselves. They're, going, they're doing the responsible thing in accordance with the CDC. Uh, we should all fear that if the district adopts an irresponsible policy like this, that it inevitably will, that will inevitably uh, affect the income of our, of our staff members, um, that they won't quarantine at all and put everybody at risk. From an educational perspective, now that remote learning is a part of education, why would we as a school district not afford our children the opportunity to be taught by their, student, by their teacher remotely, if at all possible? This is simply a better educational option under the circumstances. Staff members who have to quarantine will have to recuperate money to the district for a sub. These are the things I'm grabbing off of the forum. Again, it is an unfair and potentially dangerous policy by the district for one, educators or citizens also. Currently, most businesses are taking the safety precautions of allowing their staff to work from home whenever possible, let alone if they have been exposed to the virus. Is the board going on record today saying that they would rather take the chance of a possible COVID spread because staff members cannot afford to take a paid leave of absence when they, when they are sick? Well, I'm sorry, when they are not sick, when they just have to quarantine. Also, is the board going on record today by saying that they would rather educators take a leave than educate our Belleville children? 
because this is precisely what this policy is presuming. Moving on, gentlemen, the gentleman that just was up here, Mr. Rodriguez, is that correct? Thank you, yes. Um, I mentioned this tutoring space, so I listened. Again, Dr. Tomko briefly spoke about this. Um, superintendent stated that um, starting March, the district will open a program called Tutoring Space, where students will be allowed to come to school every day and sit in a supervised room where students can log in remote learning. Okay, again, and I come up here every week and I talk about the same tune, I sing the same tune. We have committees, we have a, a, a scheduling committee, we have a health and safety committee, we have a, a synchronous learning and virtual uh, learning committee. This stuff is, uh, listen, Dr. Tom wants to give me the, the, the uh, uh, recognition for that. I, I was just an idea I threw at him. I, my expectation is that that should go to a committee because there's a lot of ins and outs that, that, that have to be, it's just not a simple decision. Nothing, nothing here is black and white, ever. Nothing is black and white. Everything is gray. And I'll, that'll lead me to my last, my last thing. Again, we have committees. Every decision educational should at least be passed by the committee. You know, Doc, Doc has the ability to make his decisions on his own. But wouldn't we want to make the most informed decisions? It, we're the layman. We're out there doing the job. We see what's going on. Snow days. Doc talked adamantly about snow days and how the superintendent's union, you know, you know, they talked about having remote snow days, okay? I had, I could give you my own personal experience as a teacher. I had four kids last Friday on the snow day, right? Four kids had to leave my remote learning because they had to go help dad and their uncle and their grandfather and grandparents shovel snow. You wouldn't know that. If you're not in the classroom and you don't see these kids and you're not with these kids, you wouldn't know that. So they had to leave. And what was I going to say? No, you can't leave. You know, there, there's nothing I can say. Mom and dad called them, said, you got to go sh help us shovel the snow. So these are all things that if we pass this stuff through committee, then we will be working together. Right now, we're on the way there. I have to say that. I, I don't want to not give any credit. We are definitely on the way of working together, but we're just on the way. And we need to, we, we need, we need to uh, uh, incorporate our committees in the decisions that we make. And I'm finished talking, but I would like to appeal to the, the board on a matter that I just found that there's a, a community member out here that, that um, is not aware of the, uh, how to get up here and speak. So I just want to uh, appeal to you if you can allow this person to speak their mind, give them a few minutes up here and allow them to say what they had to say because they didn't know about the sign-in uh, procedures and everything. So the young lady over here wanted to say something and that's, again, up to the board to make that decision. Thank you. Thank you, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Mignon. Uh, just, a few, just a few comments. Um, first, let's, let's, let me be very clear. There, these, uh, what Mr. Mignon was stating that I was talking about with regard to COVID responses to teacher absences, quarantines, is not board policy. Um, it's, it's really, it's difficult to kind of say this, so I'm, just if I get some latitude from the community um, with regard to just kind of saying it, um, there, there are some, there are some, um, um, there were some things put in place uh, by the state with regard to COVID leaves, et cetera, when COVID first came out, uh, came out, when it first appeared a year ago. Um, those, a lot of those, um, you know, leniencies and, and those, those programs, et cetera, expired on December 31st. Uh, this board has supported me and has in turn supported the teachers union, administrators union, paras, et cetera, uh, with regard to allowing those accommodations to move forward the best we can. Um, again, starting January 1st, a lot of the COVID leave, quote unquote, that people were taking prior ended officially. So, so we continue, just to make it very clear, we continue to make a lot of accommodations that this board does not need to make anymore, but we do. So in saying that, as I'm also um, thinking of the taxpayer all the time, et cetera, and I know we're all talking about money and I, we hate to bring it up all the time, but you know, it's part of my job. Um, due to those accommodations that the board and I uh, have worked together on giving teachers basically really without any questions asked, which again, we know that's important during COVID. So I'm not disputing that. So I, so I need some latitude right now because I want to make sure that 
that the board, I'm not worried about myself, but I want the board to be vilified tonight in what I said at a forum um, because I, I feel very strongly about this. Um, and it might not make me popular, but it's going to make me, uh, what it, it is what it is, right? Um, but we've spent upwards of $900,000 in substitutes this year, almost a million dollars. Um, that's a lot of money in substitutes. Now, someone needs an accommodation, um, you know, because of, you know, compromised situation, et cetera, that's one thing. However, and again, I think we need to be, uh, be specific in stating that a lot of this is case by case, right? Each building has a permanent sub, okay? So a permanent sub is used almost every day to cover a class. So we try to do it the best we can. But we have individuals, and I'm not going to say teachers, I'll say anyone in district who are going on vacations, okay? Well, we all know, I think everybody probably knows, that if you choose to go on a vacation, you're going to have to quarantine. And I have a very hard time thinking that this board and this community should pay for that when somebody has to go on a vacation. I mean, again, we're, we're not stopping the vacation, we can't do that. And, and, and I, I understand that people need to do certain things. So the, the, the latitude that we are giving is, you don't need to lose your sick day, um, but you know we have to have a substitute watch your class because we can't have anybody in there that's not watching your class. That's a law that hasn't changed. So we do have subs that are sitting in class with students while teachers are home teaching. So if a teacher wants to give up uh, an unpaid day, et cetera, uh, they can, or we're willing to allow them to keep that day if they pay for the sub. Now we've done that before. This isn't anything new here. Uh, we've done that for people that have gone on unpaid leaves, et cetera. Uh, so again, this isn't anything new. But I think you have to really look at it, um, you know, uh, situation by situation. When you hear a forum like that, when you're a teacher out there hearing a forum, you think it's everybody. That's not true. That's not, that's not how it's happening. Um, we have people that are um, using sick time because they are genuinely sick or because they have um, surgeries that, were, that they need to have. No, now you know if you have a surgery, you have to quarantine. It's a different situation. You're only allowed to use a sick day if you are sick. That's the law. It's very clear. Prior to December 31st, there was COVID sick time. You could use sick time for a certain amount of time for childcare, et cetera. We're just not allowing that anymore for those situations where anyone else working in a general field uh, probably wouldn't have the, would have the same type of capacity. So, so I don't think it's, it's that far-fetched to uh, make those leniencies on specific accommodations in order so that people can, you know, go away um, or do what they need to do, you know. You know right now that if you leave New Jersey and go down to Florida for a president's weekend, you need to quarantine. Um, now, Ms. Mignon brings up a good point. Um, will that stop people from telling us that they're going away and make, well, again, I, I would hope not. These are all professionals. Um, again, if they did do that, I think that would be a, a bigger issue for them, uh, you know, and, and everybody knows everything on social media now. Um, but I think for the most part, we're talking, and even the, and, and, and I will reiterate what I did say at the forum, that a lot of the things that we're seeing on social media now are only partial, or parts of the story. It's not the whole story, right? And I think it's the same thing now. 99.9% of our staff and whatnot are coming here every day, you know, even on Friday. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that any staff member that wasn't here on Friday and took a sick day had, has to provide me with a, a doctor's note. Um, again, because you cannot take a sick day uh, because it's snowing. It's not happening. Uh, and I appreciate all those teachers that did show up, all those administrators that did show up, uh, powers, et cetera. Uh, and this is why, and I, I did have a conversation with the union about this, this is why the contract affords you personal days for personal leave. So until you exhaust all of your personal days, I don't think any of this conversation be occur should be occurring. At that point, if you've exhausted all your personal days, then maybe we have the conversation. But I don't think anybody's there yet. Um, so, so that's that. So there are specific situations that I think have to be taken case by case. But I do understand um, you know, that there is, uh, th that is, it gets a little dicey now that we're coming back to work and everybody's getting a vaccination. And, and I understand that, you know, I made it very clear several times already about July 1st. Um, so, so that's that. So there are specific situations that I think have to be taken case by case, but I do understand, 
um, you know, that there is, uh, th that is, it gets a little dicey now that we're coming back to work and everybody's getting a vaccination. And, and I understand that, you know, I made it very clear. I agree with Mr. Mignon with regard to the committees. And we're trying to um, involve committees as much as possible. I mean, we do it for hiring. We've done a lot that we've done since I got here. But, you know, when Mr. Mignon did bring up the, uh, the idea of that little tutoring club or whatever we're going to call it, I mean, I just went into action and made it happen. I don't know really why we needed a committee for that. I mean, I don't want to argue about that point. I mean, I guess you could meet for anything, but I mean, to me, it was just opening a space, getting a supervisor and, and have students log in, um, you know, instead of at home. So they're in more of an educational environment because we know I have four kids, you know, and they're, you know, they're home on, on bed in, uh, in a bed, um, you know, walking around by a TV. I mean, I'd rather them sit in a, in a library um, in their school and be focused, um, you know, on what's happening next door. So, um, I, you know, I just, uh, you know, not, not to disagree, but I just don't really, didn't really think that we needed a committee for that. I just kind of moved into action, uh, which I do sometimes. So, uh, but yeah, again, I, again, I think uh, we're trying to keep the lines of communication open. Um, if anything, all the, um, the discussions that we did have uh, as a board and as a community and as a unions and, and superintendent and um, walking around uh, you know, for their safety visits and they're bringing on an independent consultant who really helped us with airflow issues. You know, all of that is a testament to, yes, as Mr. Mignon said, uh, and I will reiterate that, our teachers do genuinely love being here, even though they, you know, it was, a, it was a dangerous and tumultuous time. Um, so, so again, that's why this board continues to accommodate as much as we can. But sometimes when it stares you in the face, it's really difficult to not uh, work around it a little bit. So, um, so that's just, you know, we'll continue to work, continue to communicate the best we can. Thank you. Giselle, I'm not even going to try and say your last name. Good evening. My name is Giselle Srashak, and I am at 466 Cortland Street in Belleville. Um, this is my first time in a board meeting, and uh, I have to say it is a little nerve-wracking to come here and uh, speak my mind but I feel that is something that I wanted to do for a while. So I'm a mother of three kids. One of them is in high school, uh, middle school, and the elementary school. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I have a couple questions. I'm sorry if this has been talked about before. Again, this is my first time. Uh, and I'm here not only on behalf of myself, but in behalf of many parents who I've had the opportunity to interact with, and they feel the same way. They feel stranded, and they also feel like the children have fell through the cracks with this whole COVID crisis. Um, so these are my questions. Do we have an opening date for full-time in-person school? Um, what is the reason that school hours have been reduced to 12 noon um, for the high school and 1 p.m. for the elementary school, even with virtual learning? Um, what is the science backing up school closings since the CDC is recommending that the kids are back in, in person? And uh, private schools and daycares are open in New Jersey. Um, also, studies show that children are getting depressed falling behind in learning and suicide cases on children amongst the uh, ages of uh, in middle school and high school um, have skyrocketed. Kids are committing suicide. Um, also, as a parent, I ha oh, also I have to say here that many states in the U.S. have opened their schools full-time in person, and there have been no significant surges or uh, in COVID cases. So there's, again, no science backing up this whole cl school closings. Um, I've also had the opportunity to see the opinions on some teachers on Facebook groups, and a lot of them are willing to go back to in-person and teaching, uh, which is very scary and discouraging. I have also heard of teachers who are eager to get back, who understand that the children need to be back in person. Um, so my question is, how are we planning to bring them back since COVID is not going anywhere? Uh, it's been almost a year since the kids have been home. Um, I think that's way more than enough time for us to already have a plan uh, and for the kids to go back. And um, 
since we know that virtual school is just not working and it's not feasible for, for the children. And then what are we doing in terms of the vaccine rollouts for, for the teacher and the staffs? Um, how soon are they getting vaccinated? And um, so that's basically my question. When are we finally going to really start doing what's best for the kids and their education um, and, and focus on their mental health? And uh, also, when are we going to actually follow the science? I understand that there are also a lot of parents who are not willing to bring their kids back. So I was wondering if there will be an option for uh, those parents who are not willing to bring the kids back to school to, for the kids to stay uh, in per, I mean, virtual. Um, and then for those parents who want to bring their kids back, is there an option for, for us to do that? Uh, and then lastly, what is the plan on getting the kids up to date with um, academically once they do go back. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. That was, there was a lot of questions there. Um, so if, if I don't answer them, if you wanna give me a call tomorrow or at my office, I could, you know, we can definitely talk more. Um, many of those questions are really above our level here. It's more government stuff, but I'll just kind of give you a breakdown of some of the things that you said. So um, the full-time in-person schooling throughout the full day just isn't logistically possible. And there was, originally there was a few reasons for that. Number one was we wanted to de decrease the contact time early on because we weren't sure, you know, how COVID spread. Um, now it's, uh, in, uh, right now we are still trying to get through this year um, you know, one of the issues we have is that um, right now because of the CDC and New Jersey Health Department of Health regulate, regulations, um, wh where our students have a mask on at all times and they are six feet from each other or, you know, within a certain amount of time frame, um, we, we really are socially distancing properly and it really doesn't cause us to quarantine if there's a case. Um, one of the concerns was that if, as we remove our masks to eat, that kind of breaks that a little bit, right? So um, right now, the way those CDC regulations are and whatnot, it becomes very difficult to be here a full day and feed kids. Now, we do do that preschool, et cetera. They have to have a snack, but um, in, in general terms, it's not really conducive to what the regulations are spelled out. Now, that's not Belleville. That's just the, the, the rules right now. You brought up private schools and preschools. Unfortunately, I, I really don't think they need to follow those regulations, believe it or not. Um, we're a public entity, we have to, so that's, you know, we're based on funding. Um, and we, think, we feel we should do that anyway, uh, because we have kept the numbers down. Um, but you brought up a few interesting part, things about um, um, the learn, basically the learning gap and uh, you know, the virtual options for next year. I'm, I'm, Guessing that there will be a full virtual option for parents as well. I can't see the governor or even you know federally them just saying everybody get back in now September first. I don't think that's going to happen. I think parents are still going to be a little um, you know hesitant to do to bring stu some students back um, or their children back. So I think that would be those individual parents would have their kids at home and they would log into a classroom. Um, at that point, though, and I, d I have had said this a few times. Uh, we here in Belleville feel um, very strongly that after the vaccine is, is allowed uh, or is permitted to everyone, which we're hoping is, which they're still saying should be by the end of the summer, um, that we are going to open um, to the best of our ability to get everyone in as, as, as much as we can. Right now, we have uh, extended all of our classrooms to what I call COVID capacity. So we, we've gotten as many students in as possible, and now we've added Fridays. Um, so we're doing everything we can. Uh, the board tonight um, on one of the uh, resolutions, I don't know if it was 5.8 or whatever number it was, um, is a letter to the governor requesting that vaccines be made available immediately for our teachers who, who want them. Uh, I've made it very clear, and I, and I think I have the pulse of this board in stating that the board at this time is not going to mandate any vaccines. We don't think that's really our place. Um, but if it's uh, an individual's choice not to get that, they still need to return to work. So that's what we're looking for for the next couple of months. And you talk about those learning gaps, and I did mention at the forum that uh, we are putting together um, these sessions in the summer for students free of charge um, that are going to talk, we're going to work on 
um, basic skills or exit skills from one year that are learning gapped, um, and then introductory skills into the transition year. So for example, if you have a fifth grade student right now, um, and he or she you know, needs some remediation in decimals, or I'm probably wrong in saying that, but whatever it is at that point, um, then the summer class, they'll work on some of those remedial skills and then um, transition into what they need for the beginning of sixth grade. So we're right now, our curriculum team is working on that. So we're gonna open up pods of those learning environments. I think probably August would be the better idea just so that you, you know, you kind of get a little jump start and then come in in September. So we're, we're trying to address that as well. So as, as, a, as a board, as an administration, and as a district, we're trying to do everything we possibly can to get as many students here as possible, keep them here. Um, I, will, I would just like to add, because I, I think if I say it now, um, we could all start thinking about it. One of the issues, and, and we did talk about quarantine a few times, right? So the reality is that during certain breaks or certain times throughout the year, people are, are going to go away. It's just, it's inevitable and it should happen, right? You should see your family during Thanksgiving. Um, you should spend time New Year's Eve. We definitely need that now more than anything, right? So. This board, I'll speak for the board, but myself in particular, we're not naive to think that when we do have a spring break or a Memorial Day weekend here, people are going to you know, enjoy the company of others. Um, that's why sometimes we are proactive in a week off or a virtual week, just because it just makes more sense. Because we know that if we do, as Mr. Mignon brought up, not to, not to put your name in there, Mike, but um, you know, if we want teachers to comply to help us keep this COVID-19 to a minimum, and we know they go away when we have to respect that they're going to quarantine. So, so you will see that. So you did see that when we came back from um, winter break, right? We took a, a few weeks off um, just because we knew that we'd have too many people on quarantine and students. And, and you did see a little spike in the numbers in Belleville at the time. So, so I would think that the board over the next month or so it is the board's um, prerogative to, um, to change the calendar or whatnot. But... Um, I think that uh, we would probably entertain a possible, you know, virtual week after something like that. But beyond that, um, you know, as long as our numbers, as long as I can uh, mitigate any type of spread, we will remain open. Um, if there comes a time that I can't um, faithfully and transparently talk to the parents and the board and say, we don't really know where this is coming from, well, you know, the case is in a, in a building, We'll close that building down until we figure it out or until the quarantine period goes away. We've only done that a few times this year, um, but we don't really wait around for that. We, we do that immediately. So, so that's really, right now we're really basing still everything. The CDC changes daily, um, you know, and, and I am, again, I have no information on this except that I think March 31st we're going to see some interesting information coming out. Um, but I also feel that, um, you know, I think the next thing you're going to see is the social distancing footage maybe you know change a little bit because if you recall when we first came back in September the first the initial um the initial thing that was put out uh was that as long as you wear a mask you don't have to be six feet apart right so I think we and then that changed immediately afterwards so I think you're going to see that immediately which will let us allow us to get more students in classrooms I don't know if the mask goes away ever, I mean, I'm sure it will at some point, but I don't know how soon that would be. That's way above me making that call. Um, but I will say that as soon as, you know, we get information from the Department of Health, Department of Health and, and uh, the governor's office or whatever, we definitely will implement that. So, but if you have any other questions or you want to talk, we can definitely do that on the phone or you know, maybe we can answer more specific questions. Thank you. Could I have a motion to close public participation? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Items, remarks, and committee reports to be presented by board members. Mr. Velez? Hi, yeah, I want to thank everybody, first of all, for coming out tonight. Um, in regards to the curriculum committee, we have not had a meeting yet. It's very slow this time of the year. It usually uh, gets uh, going at the end of the year and the beginning of the year, so around uh, June, August, that time. I also want to thank the rest of the board for supporting this letter to the governor. It's very important that our teachers are prioritized in Belleville. They should be prioritized, and I'm very proud of the board for taking this decision. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Velez. Mr. Tunis. Hello, everybody. Let me start by saying I have nothing new at this time to report in terms of the um, com my uh, community committee. Um, as far as that goes, I'd like to just make a little comment here. I'd like to commend uh, Mrs. Demikroff on a beautiful, wonderful, great presentation you provided us here this evening. We haven't seen a presentation in a long time. And for the uh, Black uh, History Month presentation, it was really, really well done. So I'd like to also thank all the children that were involved in that as well in the district. And uh, that's really about it. Thank you. Everybody get home safe. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Tunis. Ms. Bennett Meany. Yep, good evening, everyone. I don't have any report for tonight, but I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out. I wanted to thank Dr. Tomko for the forum. It was very informative. Um, and I, I do want to continue to make sure that we're all working together in our triangle, our um, superintendent, the board, the teachers, and the parents to uh, make sure that we um, go through these motions and, and continue to try to work towards getting some of the kids back into school. So thank you all, and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Bennett Meany. I just want to thank everybody for coming. Our next meeting is on March 15th. And can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye.